Our scripture from today, it's, it's short, it's sweet, and it's to the point and thought-provoking. <laughs> Hebrews 13, 1 through 2. Keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing so, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, welcome to worship. My name is Matt German. I'm one of the pastors here at the church, and I love leading this service. It is so fun. And by leading this service, I mean I get to preach the gospel. If you notice, uh, this service is actually uh, entirely lay-led. Really, all I do is preach and say, peace out, we'll see you next week. You know, more or less, right? But we have several people that help facilitate this worship. Those who range from uh, being worship leaders to those who play in the band to those who extend hospitality and greet you at the door. We have those who read scripture and we have those who volunteer to read children's messages. It takes on average about 15 people to pull this service off every single week. And many of you are involved in that uh, regularly. And I just want to throw some love at you uh, as your pastor. I appreciate the fact that the laity of this church is so uh, actively and intricately uh, involved in leading of God's praises and facilitating that for us all uh, this morning. Particularly, I want to give a shout out and thanks to Gabby for leading worship this morning. She pinch hit it uh, to this week as uh, our scheduled worship leader uh, was going to be gone, and I appreciate Gabby stepping uh, into that. And I think she did a wonderful job, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So at this time, I want to invite you, uh, as we've been doing regularly in our recent sermon series, pull out your GPS, if you would. That's contained in your bulletin. And this is your Grow, Pray, and Support Guide. This is a great tool that will give you some study resources through the week that will go a little bit deeper and beyond what I'm going to be talking about here uh, this morning. Also, it'll give you some activities to work on with your family and will challenge you to apply uh, the gospel teaching in your life in practical and helpful ways. If you hear something insightful or useful to you uh, this morning, there's also space for you to write that down. So if you have a writing utensil, uh, feel free to, to be taking notes uh, this morning. So we have been in the middle of a sermon series uh, entitled The Generous Life. And we've determined that we are stewards of three particularly generous gifts from God. Those should be coming up on screen. We've been walking through those uh, this week. First and foremost, we are stewards of... There it is. Thank you. We are stewards... I was testing you to see if you remembered, right? No. We are stewards, of course, of of creation, right? That God created this wonderful world and gave us dominion over it and how we treat the earth actually matters. It makes a big difference. You remember in Genesis 1 that God created in the course of six days in that story of creation in Genesis 1. He, he, he created something, spoke it into existence, stepped back and said, this is good. He created something else, spoke it into existence, stepped back and said, this was good. And you remember he created humankind on the sixth day and said, you're pretty good too. But remember, it was only when God stepped back and looked at the totality, the whole of creation, he said, what? This is very good. Good. You guys have been listening and paying attention. So it's really when all creation is working in equilibrium and harmony with one another that it's actually very good. We came to figure out that we're actually not the center of the universe. We're just a big, we're just a slice of, of the pie. But God has given us a responsibility as he, God has given us dominion over the earth and to be caretakers and to steward all that we see uh, before us. So in the gift of creation, we also have a great responsibility. We have a great responsibility. We also discussed last week that we are also stewards of our finances. And that's, um, that's a fun thing to preach about, right? As much as it's probably fun for you to, to listen about. I hope that last week was actually really helpful and challenging to you in, in good ways. I encouraged you to practice six biblical principles uh, in, your, in your finances. I think those are coming up next here on the, on the screen, if we could go to the next one. Uh, go to the next one. Go to the next one. <laughs> I'll get there. We said, uh, put God first in your living and in your giving. 
to prepare a spending plan and track monthly expenses. I encourage you to simplify your lifestyle and to live beneath your means, to create margin in your life, right? To provide immediately for an emergency fund. Dave Ramsey suggests starting with $1,000. That allows you, when an emergency comes, to get off plastic and be able to manage your financial affairs without going into debt. Dave Ramsey encourages you to pay off all credit card debt and to use a cash system. And then, of course, to practice long-term savings and uh, investing habits. And you may be saying, Matt, why, you're getting a little particular about finances. And you know, we, we, we looked at all these through the lens of scripture last week and also discussed the fact that apart from discussing the kingdom of God, your personal finance is what Jesus talked about the very most in the Gospels. And that came as a surprise uh, to some people. Eleven of the parables in the Gospels are dedicated to how we allocate our financial resources. Jesus says, for where your treasure is, there your heart is also. So if you want to know what your priorities are in life, if you want to know what you truly value, if uh, you're old school, you can open up your checkbook and look at the registry on that, and that'll tell you where your heart is. Right? If you're like me, I carry one of these with me, and I have a U.S. bank app, and it tells me every dollar I spend, where I spent it, and sometimes I just say, man, money just seems to flow through my fingers, and I don't know where uh, it went. So implying these habits in your life will not only allow you to uh, free you up from the stress of your finances, but it also allows you to live more generously. Last week I said, I don't believe people aren't generous because they don't want to be. I think most people are good and glad-hearted folk, but we don't imply these biblical principles in our life. We don't live within our means. We don't create margin in our life. We don't put God first in our living and in our giving. And when we do these things, not only are we freed up in the stresses of our finances, but we're also freed up in a new lifestyle to be more generous and to bless someone else. If all that we have and all that we are is God's, how would God call you to steward your resources? That was the challenge last week. And then, of course, there's the third facet of all of this. The, the, third, uh, the third gift that we're, go to the next one. The third gift that we're uh, called to steward is that of the good news itself. Stewarding the good news of the gospel also matters, right? This is not just the pastor's job. This is why there's laity that's involved in our worship service. This is, why, this is why it matters. We've been impacted by the life-changing, hope-filled, salvific, and saving good news of Jesus Christ. And we want more than anything, at least I do, I want more than anything for others to come to know the joy that I found uh, in Jesus so stewarding the good news really matters. And today, that's what we're getting into. We're going to talk about what it means uh, to steward the good news. Let's pray. Good and gracious God, we, we love you. Jesus, you are our light. You are our salvation. You are everything. We're here today, Lord, to, to bring you glory and to study your word and to grow more faithfully in the way that you would instruct us to live. So God, I ask that you would speak through the faulted words of a very human preacher, that uh, what is useful for building up your kingdom may be heard and retained. Whatever is distracting from that, Lord, may that fall away. Lord, I ask this not for my reputation, but I ask this for your glory this morning. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. So I shared with the children this morning that one of my biggest pet peeves in the entire world is waiting in line. Anybody else enjoy waiting in line? Oh my gosh. I tell you what, particularly, you know, the first Sunday of the month is Communion Sunday, but it's also Pickle Dip Sunday. I don't know if you're aware of that. They serve Pickle Dip out at, the, out at the, the food line. And I have to tell you, sometimes it's really hard for me to embrace when Jesus said, the last shall be first. When it comes to, <laughs> when it comes to the line for the treats and, and the coffee. But I, I'm not good at waiting in line. I, I, I lack patience uh, when it comes to that. And I have found this to be nowhere more true than at retail stores, particularly anytime I go into Walmart. This is the world's largest retailer, my friends. They have 40 registers in any given store, and you can count on maybe a whopping two of them being attended by a human being. You aware of that? You are guaranteed to stand in line there. And now, furthermore, you get the pleasure the absolute pleasure of bagging and scanning your own groceries. 
right? Because they've installed these self-checkout things that are supposed to make things go faster, be more, be more efficient. But if you're like me, I get to these things and I mess them up terribly and it's anything but fast. It's anything but efficient. And I end up waiting longer, growing more and more and more frustrated. But here's hope. They have a staff member that watches you be frustrated, right? They have a staff member that's dedicated to these eight registers that stands there and just laughs and radios under their coworkers about how bad Pastor Matt is messing up this stupid register. But eventually they do come over and they will help you. And I want to tell you about a friend that I made. Uh, her name is uh, Trish. I was at a Davenport Walmart a year ago, and I don't even remember what I was buying, but Addison and I we were in the store. I came to this self-checkout register, and uh, I, I couldn't get the dumb thing to work. I, I scanned my item, and it, it said that I had an item, but it said it was Kit giving me all these prompts. So finally it said, please place your item in the bagging area. Apparently there's, there's, it's a scale, right? So it wants to make sure that the item that you scan is actually the weighted item that's registered to be there. And uh, I couldn't get this thing uh, to work. And I, I, Trish comes over. And I said, Trish, man, I, I saw her name tag. I said, I have no idea what I'm doing. And Trish says, can't you read? <laughs> now, you know, Trish, I, uh, <laughs> Trish, I, I love Jesus, and, and my daughter's standing here with me. Don't, don't, don't test me, Trish. <laughs> this is my, my brain, All right? So she, she says, can't you read? And I, I read the thing, and it said, place the item in the bagging area. And I did that, and then afterwards it said, how would you like to pay? And I said, well, I'd love to use my debit card. So I selected the, 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 the debit card thing, and I, I put my card in, and then I started punching in numbers, and then it said, decline. Apparently, I had punched in the wrong number, and Trish says, don't you have any money in your account? Oh, oh Trish. <laughs> oh, Trish. At this point, I'm, 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 starting to, I'm starting to get a little bit, uh, a little bit grumpy. And uh, after this, I notice Trish walks over to uh, the express lane and begins to verbally yell at a man who had 13 items instead of 12 items. Now, in the name of Jesus, I kind of want to lay hands on her just a little bit. You know what I'm saying? But I walked over and I said, Trish, your behavior is absolutely deplorable. And at that point, she told me where I could go, and it wasn't the customer service. <laughs> okay? Uh, I, I had no idea what she was so angry uh, I was what she was so angry about, but uh, I, I informed Trish at that point, you know, I want you to know that I happen to know the general manager of this store personally, and I'm going to be letting him know about your conduct this morning. And I pulled out my cell phone and snapped a picture of her with her name tag. Now, what Trish doesn't know is the general manager of the store is the father of a gal that I used to date in high school. And what she also she doesn't know, what she doesn't need to know, is that he doesn't think much of me. So... <laughs> But I, 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 was, I, was, I, I was pretty insistent. Ad, Addison, as we're walking out, she's like, Dad, what is, she, what is she so upset about? Why was she so angry? Why was she so rude? I said, I have no idea, but she don't know who she's messing with, man. You know? And it came to me as I was walking out with, uh, with my daughter. This verse from Hebrews uh, came to my mind. Be careful how you deal with strangers. All right? And I'm not talking about Trish's conduct with me. I'm talking about my conduct with Trish. Be careful how you deal with strangers. You might be dealing with angels and not even know it. You know, it's dawned on me how many people actually walk through life angry and just bitter and resentful. And just anybody know a Grinch? I know a few of them. I've never, been able to figure, I've never been able to figure it out. And, but what I have figured out is that I can be that guy sometimes. I can be that guy. I can have an angry attitude. I can wake up some days not feeling blessed and highly favored. I can go through the whole day not caring about your issues. The world is full of angry people. And the writer of Hebrews is telling us to be careful because not all angels wear white robes and have halos. They don't always fly around uh, the throne room of God with names like cherubim and sephirim. 
and seraphim, excuse me. Sometimes angels look like strangers. Sometimes angels may even look like angry express attendants at Walmart. Be careful how you deal with people. You just might be wrestling with an angel. You never know who you're messing with. Hebrews tells us that sometimes angels have hidden halos. We don't recognize this sometimes. Abraham and Sarah found out this out when they were told that they were going to have a son by a messenger in Genesis 18. Some hidden halos showed up at Lot's house in Genesis 19. Jacob wrestles with some hidden halos in Genesis 32. A hidden halo show up to, to Gideon to let him know that God had a call on his life. And Judges 6, hidden halos show up to uh, Manoah and his wife to inform them that they were going to have a son named Samson in Judges 13. And sometimes, listen to this, sometimes God comes to us in forms that lack the appearance of holiness. Look at the life of Jesus, for example. Jesus, the, the mouthpiece, the word of God that became flesh is rejected by humankind because this, this Messiah did not come in the way and didn't conduct himself in the way that, that the people thought he ought to. He shattered their expectations. You see, sometimes God shows up in our lives in the presence of strangers. There's a famous passage in Matthew 25, where Jesus is talking about the last judgment. And apparently, how we treat people has eternal significance for each and every one of us. You know, John Cooper was jokingly saying at Fusion on Wednesday night that, you know, in the Methodist church, we don't really talk about hell much. You know, hell has fallen on hard times in the church. <laughs> it really has. But I think that sometimes we can be so tempted to talk about uh, the grace of God, as if the grace of God is different than the judgment and the accountability of God, right? That God has called us into his marvelous light, and God has standards in which God wants us to live our life. And we do that out of a joyful obedience, not out of fear of consequence, because love has found us. We want to show love to someone else, Right? But Jesus is speaking in Matthew 25 about this concept of the last judgment. And he says, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was in prison, you visited me. When I was a stranger, you welcomed me. And his disciples said, when on earth did we do those things? And he said, well, every time you did that to the least of these, you welcomed me. And at the end of that, he contrasts it again. And he said, when I was hungry, you didn't feed me. When I was thirsty, you didn't give me something to drink. When I was naked, you didn't clothe me. When I was a stranger, you didn't welcome me. And they were cast out because they rejected Jesus. Hebrews tells us, be careful how you treat strangers. Because behind that strange face, very well may be the presence of God. God shows up in the most unlikely, unusual places. And if we're not careful, we just might miss it. So what does that mean for us today as we're called to be stewards of the good news? You know, there's a, there's a difference between evangelism and hospitality. Evangelism is how you personally share the good news of Jesus Christ with someone else. You know, hopefully that's through an invitation for them to maybe begin reading their Bible and, or an opportunity uh, to pray with them or an invite to come to church with you. Hospitality is how you welcome them, right? So we look at that systematically as a church. What does evangelism look like here in the church? Well, evangelism looks like the various study groups that we have. It, it looks like uh, some of the sermons that are preached on Sunday morning. All the mechanics of this church are centered around evangelism. But then the question becomes, what does hospitality 
look like in the church. And quite frankly, that relies on each and every single one of you. One of the best ways that we can welcome the stranger in our midst, a guest, a visitor, someone that we don't know, is by extending radical hospitality to them. And I gotta say, as, as I look around the church, and, and man, you can look at me, and I, I do this too sometimes, but sometimes, you know, especially during church, you know, we have our, I, y'all sit in the same place every week. You know, it's like we're, it's like we're creatures of habit. You know, I literally, this, not in this church, right, but in, in a prior church uh, that I served, I actually saw a member of 50 years walk up to a visitor and say, you're sitting in my pew. That's welcoming. <laughs> right? The art of hospitality falls on each and every single one of us to welcome the stranger, for we never know when we're being entertaining, when we're entertaining an angel or the presence of God in our midst. I want to introduce a concept to you around hospitality that Pastor Scott and I are hoping that this church will adopt uh, radically, and it's called 310 Connect. Take a look at the videos. Every week, somebody new visits our church. Remember, as much as we feel at home here, they might feel like a stranger, and it's up to us to change that. We want them to know that we're glad they're here and that they are welcome in our family. There's a simple concept called 310 Connect. It means at the end of our worship services, for the first three minutes, we look around in a 10-foot radius of where we're sitting. If we see someone in that space that we don't know, we stick out our hand and say hi say, I don't think I know you, and make some conversation as you walk out of the room together. You see, now you've made a connection, and they have too. And if it turns out that they have questions about our church, you can connect them further by physically taking them to a pastor or a church staff member or someone you know who can help them. 310 Connect. The first three minutes after worship, 10-foot radius, that's your outreach field. 310 Connect. Let's start this Sunday. So my friends, this, this is a practice that we want every person in this church to begin to adopt. A church this size is not a pastor-centered church. It, it can't be and it shouldn't be. This church welcomes new people not by the pastor, but by the, the vehicle of all of you in the way that you extend radical hospitality. Do you know that a guest or a visitor typically isn't interested in coming to coffee with us? Because that's, that feels more like an insider thing. We do that to be welcoming, but 90% of visitors who visit us are gonna be in the parking lot three minutes after I say amen after worship. You know that? So we have three minutes to connect with a new person. And I'm not asking you to run to the far corner of the church to connect with that person. You have a 10-foot radius. Remember, if all of us are doing this, we have three minutes, we have a 10-foot radius in which our ministry field is. And then at that point, I want you to connect with them. Connect with them. Introduce yourself. Welcome them. Introduce them to the, where the welcome center is. Invite them to come to uh, coffee with you. They may just do that by an invitation, right? Introduce them to a, to a pastor. Introduce them to a ministry leader. Introduce them to a staff member. That's how we begin to connect people into the life of the congregation. And it's how we begin to extend radical hospitality. 310 Connect. So every week through this stewardship series, as we're t this morning we're talking about stewarding the good news, I have a big question for you. In your bulletin, there is a uh, three by five index card, and I'd like you to pull that out at this time, okay? Pull that out at this time, and if you have a writing utensil, I want you to take the next 30 seconds, which we found out this morning feels like an eternity, right? But I'm gonna give you a little eternity this morning. 30 seconds worth of it. And I'm going to ask you to consider this question. Today's big question is how are you accepting the responsibility from God 
of extending hospitality to our guests and to our visitors, because this is all of our responsibility as the body of Christ. As you think about this and as you answer this, I want you to write that down in your 3x5 index card. Don't sign it, but there will be a table out in the gathering space, and I want to encourage you to leave that uh, out at the table uh, in the gathering space. You also notice that every week through this series that the answers from the prior weeks are actually on display. If you're curious what some of the, uh, some of the others in your midst uh, are wrestling with and thinking about as we walk through this Generous Life series as well. So take 30 seconds and consider how are you extending hospitality to our guests and to our visitors? You know, as I was walking out of that Walmart with uh, Addison's hand in mine, and she was asking me, why, why, is, why is she so angry, Dad? What did, what did we do to her? I couldn't help but think of this Hebrews 13 passage. Be careful how you show welcome to strangers, for you may be entertaining angels. And I wonder, and I wasn't so much thinking about Trisha's behavior. I was thinking about my own. You know, it was kind of a convicting moment for me personally. And I wondered, I mean, it was obvious, Trish was having a bad day, right? And it seemed like Trish's goal to make sure that I was having a bad day. That seemed obvious. But it began to occur to me, what if Trish was having a bad day for a pretty good reason? I had no idea what was going on under the hood within her life. What if Trish had just found out that she had lost a family member? What if Trish was dealing with a broken relationship? What if Trish had received news from a doctor that she didn't want to hear that particular day? What if she was having a bad day for a good reason? And then I began to think, how could I change the trajectory of Trish's day? What if I, what if I instead of uh, snapping her picture and threatening to report her to my ex-girlfriend's dad, <laughs> What if I would have just been like, you know, you seem to be having a hard time. Are you okay? How would that have changed the trajectory of that encounter? Or maybe if I was even bold enough in my Christian witness, Trish, you know, I'm, I'm one of those praying types. Is there something that I could pray for you for? How would that have changed the trajectory of her day? And what's more, how would it have changed the trajectory of mine? Sometimes halos are just hidden. Sometimes we don't recognize the presence of God in the midst of the stranger. But my friends, be careful how you entertain strangers. For there may be hidden halos among them. That's my encouragement to you this week as you go from this place that we would extend radical hospitality, not only to our guests and to our visitors. If you're one of those this morning, welcome. This sermon wasn't probably for you. It was for the rest of us that need to make sure that you know that you're loved by Jesus Christ uh, in this place. But for all of us, the challenge this week is to go and extend radical hospitality, not knowing when we're entertaining the very presence of God in someone else. So my friends, as we go from this place, may the love of God, the grace of Jesus Christ, and the presence of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. And as we go from this place to extend radical hospitality and the love of Jesus Christ, all who find that as a stranger, may they find in us generous and gentle friends. The service is over. Go in peace. Amen. This has been a broadcast of the First United Methodist Church in Cedar Falls. We're glad you joined us. We're here to help you on your journeys of life and faith. We gather for worship services and classes, support groups, and just for fun groups, and you're welcome at any one of them. Just show up and say, hi, I'm new here, and we'll take it from there. You can learn more about our church at aboutfirst.com, and you can follow us on Facebook and YouTube, too. If you can't make it in person, we'll be right here on your TV at this same time next week. We'll see you then.